Excellent. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you to this um, little um, video uh, with me, Neil De Costa from Kaplan. Um, and in these series, in these success uh, series, what we have is we have the opportunity of meeting uh, previous Kaplan students who have become extremely successful in their careers. And, uh, you know, these, uh, these previous students are now role models for, for other students. And they have so much um, uh, wisdom and uh, inspiration to share with us so that it will help all of us in our journey through our studies and becoming a successful accountant. So today I'd like to uh, introduce you to Chengai Ruzetsko, who was an advanced tax uh, student with me at Kaplan. And Chengai has gone on and she's become extremely successful. And now she's a financial controller of a company. Um, obviously she, she's an FCCA. And in addition to this, Chengai is an amazing sports person and um, she's uh, represented internationally. Uh, so you, you've played for, is it England? England, you no, played, played for Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. Ah, she's played for Zimbabwe in yes. the Masters World Cup uh, hockey uh, tournament. So mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Chengai, and, and well, welcome to this um, uh, little interview um, whereby you have a chance to tell your story. Thank you for inviting me, Neil. I'm really yeah. excited to be here. Excellent, excellent. So Chengai, I want to start by um, you telling the, uh, telling the viewers a little bit about about Zimbabwe and what it was like for you to grow up, because many of our viewers have not had a chance to experience, uh, you know, uh, being in Africa, for example. Absolutely, Neil. So, you know, I mean, London is just so multicultural and everybody has their own different background where they're coming from. For some people, coming to live in London is an upgrade to their life. But for us, growing up in Zimbabwe in the 80s and in the 90s, we had a very high standard of living. And coming to the UK was more like a rude awakening. <laughs> you know, the standard of living actually dropped. Absolutely, you know, absolutely. So, so I think pe people's view of Africa, uh, looking at the media, is that, you know, Africa is, uh, you know, they, they, they feel it's full of undernourished children and so on. But, um, but I know someone like you and indeed myself as well, you know, growing up in middle class families, we went, we had the opportunity to go to very good schools, obviously, many of the school systems, they are the equivalent of private schools here. And, and the standard of education was extremely high. Exactly. And I understand that uh, while you were doing your A levels, um, you then started thinking of accountancy. Am I right? Well, what happened, Neil, it just yeah. came by chance, because mm -hmm. I had initially wanted to study medicine. And since I was five years old, I always said, I wanna be a doctor. And when I now started studying uh, the sciences, I realized that my passion for things like physics and chemistry was not the same anymore. And I was now doing my A-levels and I decided not to choose those subjects as a result. And I didn't know what I was going to do with my life, but I knew that maths was my favorite subject. And it just happened so, uh, so, so by chance that um, Deloitte visited our school and they were, uh, looking to handpick some students who were outstanding. So there were certain students who'd been studying accountancy and business, economics, all the right subjects from GCSE to A-level. And they had knew that they wanted to get into, at that time, which was one of the big five, now it's the big four. And um, I didn't even know who they were. I was walking past the school hall. I had a sporting uh, practice I was supposed to be at and it had been canceled and I didn't know what to do with myself. And a school friend of mine just said to me, Deloitte are here, Chengai, you need to be in the school hall. And I said, who are they? They're auditors, she said. I said, what's his auditors? I've never heard of that. And I, I said, well, I don't want to go somewhere and you know, just be wasting my time. But she, she literally pushed me into the school hall. I caught the eye of the audit manager and he said to me, because of all the outstanding awards on your blazer, normally a student would have four or five blazers, uh, colors on their blazer, sorry. Um, I had more than 14 or 15 colors on my blazer. And he said, if you can do that many things that well, all at the same time, you're hired. So he said to me, you don't even have to go through the five stage interview process. Um, you can start with us and you'll be doing your articles at the age of 18. And that's how I actually found myself into the accountancy profession. That's incredible. That's absolutely incredible. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I went to a similar, you know, I know m m many of the schools in, in Africa were built around uh, the British, uh, the British uh, system, 
And and that was the ultimate accolade, you know, having Absolutely. those, you know, house colors or school exactly. colors, you know, if you represented the school, you've got school colors on your exactly. blazer. So I, I personally was not like you, um, you know, I, I didn't have all your uh, sporting ability. Um, um, and I know how competitive it was. So in fact, from a, quite a young age then, Chengai, would you say that you were quite competitive and you wanted to excel at what you were doing? You know, Neil, I remember when I went to boarding school at the age of five and uh, we had to do three hours of sport every day, Monday to Friday, and a fourth hour were of cross country. And then Saturday and Sunday, we had athletic meetings, swimming galas. So I was hockey captain. We started playing hockey at the age of eight. I was hockey captain from the age of eight until I was 18. I was athletics captain at junior school and high school as well. I did every sport and for every sport I played first team. And I remember having a conversation with one of my five-year-old classmates when I first got to school. And I said to her that, look, if they're going to force us to run around like this and do every sport under the sun, I'm not going to just do it and do it halfway. I'm gonna make sure I get into first team for every single sport. And that's what I did from junior school it's absolutely oh, incredible awesome. yeah because yeah I, I know how competitive it was as well you see because everyone wanted that recognition you see but i think that that that, that, that that's indicative of what your character was that yeah. you know you even from a young age you did want to excel at everything you did and i think uh, that's an important quality for people to have you know rather than just coasting through life it's trying true. to do it Excellent. enough to get by it's, yeah it's a mindset neil in everything i do whether i'm doing my work and I'm on my laptop whether i'm the, on the sports field whether i'm training in the gym if i'm going to do it i'm going to do it to the best of my ability i don't know how to do things halfway yeah that, that i think that that's a very important takeaway that students watching this um um can benefit from so rather than um rather than trying to do the minimum or perhaps resent what you're doing what you have to do is apply yourself and you'll be shocked at what you can achieve that's true that's so yeah. true absolutely great now i i know that you know you know uh, everything was going well for you in zimbabwe but then obviously uh they 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 were some there was a lot of political unrest and that's that right. led to um economic uh issues in zimbabwe that, that that affected everyone who was there and uh you had to make a very difficult decision to then leave what was your comfortable life in zimbabwe and come over to the uk Absolutely. So I worked for a few years for Deloitte in audit, and then I worked for IBM in their finance department. And within the same month, the multinationals in Zimbabwe decided to withdraw from Zimbabwe. And that's when I had, had to make the decision to follow my family who had already been in the UK for several years. So that's when I came to the UK and obviously everything changed from there. Yes, yes, I know, because um, obviously in Zimbabwe, you know, I grew up in Kenya as well. We had, you know, excellent weather. I mean, to us, uh, you know, bad weather was probably just the rainy season, you know, exactly. it's either, it was either sunny or rainy. Uh, exactly. But but when you came here, I think, uh, uh, you know, you, you were experiencing things like snow and, and bitter yeah. cold for the first time. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so it, it, it can't have been easy making that transition uh, from there to the UK for you. Absolutely. It was a whole culture shock. <laughs> and uh, how did um, how did you react to being in a place like London, whereby you probably didn't know that many people? Obviously, you had your family with you, but you didn't have all your friends. Uh, you didn't have the kind of comfortable job that you had back home. You know, adjusting to London, you know, there were many restrictions that were imposed in terms of work. So I couldn't work full-time, for example, I was on a student visa and I would change from student visa to student visa like many people have. And it's very difficult because, um, you know, we could only work 20 hours a week. And if you're looking for finance role, many agencies were saying many of the finance roles are full-time roles. So it was very difficult to now get into the UK accountancy market because, you know, we're restricted by work. And, uh, you know, you just have to take things in your stride and for me, that meant just taking whatever work came my way. I wasn't fussy. I just needed to keep my hands busy. And I knew that I needed to put uh, what I needed to do, whatever needed to be done to put food on the table. 
Yeah, so, so um, it, you know, uh, coming from that comfortable life to, um, to accept, you know, to being in a position where you have to accept any job that comes your way can't have been easy, okay? But yes. what gave you the strength to, to keep on going on? Because it, was, it would be very easy to get frustrated. And I know uh, many people do this, you see? So they, they, they um, because their lives perhaps, so we have lo lots of people, lots of people who immigrate, for example, to the UK, yes. but their lives back home may have been easier than what they have to endure here. Yes. Um, and um, and uh, they, they struggle with that. So what kind of uh, advice would you give people who, after. That is such an interesting question, Neil. What gave you the strength to carry on? Yes. And for me, I was searching and I was searching, I was searching for religion. I was searching for God. I just knew I, I needed to know God. And it was in 2002 that I got introduced to a church and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And from then onwards, I never looked back. And I've now been 20 years in the same church and I've been serving the Lord and it's my faith in God and just, you know, and spending time with God every day in prayer, in worship, reading my Bible, you know, attending church services, developing that network, that community, being part of people who serve within the church household and, you know, knowing that you have a call on your life and that God has a destiny for you because it's quite traumatic when you've worked for blue chip companies and then now all of a sudden, you you know, I find myself doing jobs like cleaning. I even did nursing. And it can be very disheartening. And it can be very disheartening because obviously back home in Zimbabwe, I'm sure, you know, you had cleaners, um, you, 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 your domestic help in the house exactly, that you the lived in. And, and now stuff. you're making that transition, you see, yes. and, and you're having to do cleaning for other people. So, um, yes. and, and um, you know, it, it's interesting you said that because I think, I mean, obviously people watching this program won't necessarily be be Christian, but they, they will come from all different religions. That's right. And, but what you're saying is that you can get a lot of strength from your spiritual beliefs. And Absolutely. when you're going through these challenges, it's that strength that you get from your spiritual beliefs that keeps you going. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so well, one thing I would say is that um, uh, this has been a common theme amongst other people I've spoken to, whereby their religion and their spiritual beliefs. So we don't even have to have kind of a formal, uh, some people don't have formal religious back uh, beliefs. But yes. uh, certainly their spiritual identity is yes. what gives them a lot of strength. Absolutely. It's about that relationship. If you can have a relationship, you know, like for me, it's with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What it does, it gives you a future. It gives you a hope. You know, in the Bible, it says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. But if you, if you have a focus, if you know where you're going and where you want to get to, I mean, for me, speaking to you now, Neil, I was just thinking this morning that how is it that I'm now having a, a meeting with Neil talking about the experience that I had at Kaplan and the successes that I've had subsequent to that. But I remember the day when even attending Kaplan was a mere pipe dream for me. I could only afford some cheap little accounting school, but my dream was Kaplan. And I remember very clearly the day when I said, I put together my coins and all I want to do is catch buses into London from Surrey. And I just want to look at the Kaplan building because that's my dream. I know. And, and I, I found that so strange because obviously yeah. when I lectured you and so on, I just assumed that, you know, you had the same financial resources as everyone else. And I didn't know that it was such a struggle for you to even pay for your Kaplan fees. Absolutely. It, it yeah. was a struggle. Mm. And, you know, ACCA is no easy task, you know, it we, no. we were failing exams over and over, especially your tax, advanced taxation exam. Neil, that is the hardest exam in the whole of ACCA by far. <laughs> I mean, the textbook alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's a big, big challenge. Yeah it's, yeah, it's like four times the size of some of the other subjects textbooks. Exactly. And, and I think I think, as you said, Chang'a, with some of the other subjects, like perhaps, you know, audit or maybe some 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 of the other subjects you studied yes. because of your previous experience, you yes. would be able to judge uh, what an appropriate answer would be. Exactly. So I actually found the advanced audit exam very easy 
unlike my classmates and I was able to help them during yes. break times and during lunch times. I never had a break time. I never had a lunch time because people would always say to me, Chengai, you seem to have this ongoing rapport with the lecturer. You understand what's going on. I'm lost. Can you help me? You see? So I would help others because for me, I knew that I wanted to specialize in advanced taxation and in advanced audit because I'd worked in audit and I love audit. And to this day, I still love audit. And when I'm working with my teams, it's not just about the day to day. Every day I'm saying to them, we need to be audit ready. You don't wait until your end and then start running around trying to get your team audit ready. You know, I was speaking to a friend of mine who says, oh, there's somebody I know and they're an accountant. And every time it's your end and the auditors come in, they turn into an alcoholic and they have to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, you need to know how to manage yourself yes. and manage your team. So, so I think that, 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 that that's another important um, takeaway for people watching this that, um, you know, what you've done is you've taken your your skill set from from your professional studies yes. and then you've looked to see how to improve the processes in the organization you work for absolutely yeah and and by you doing that by being well organized by uh by communicating your ethos to uh to the rest of your team you've you've managed to create a much more dynamic and efficient organization Absolutely. I remember the first lecture with you, Neil, and you gave us a list of 30 questions and you said to everyone, I would like you to start with the first question from day one. And I thought, whoa, this guy is throwing us in the deep end. We haven't even read the textbook and he's saying doing exam questions. Guess what? You work with me on day one. I'm talking about audit. We don't wait until year end. Every day, you've got to make sure every transaction is audit ready. Every process is followed according to the instructions in the procedures. One thing I want to ask you, Chingai, which I know is a, a, probably a bit difficult for you to talk about, but you've been very uh, candid in us uh, to us, is um, 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 you found yourself at one point, I know while you're studying, you found yourself in a homeless situation. Absolutely. And, and so you did not even have a home to go back to and uh, you were studying. And how did uh, how did um, how did you get through this extremely challenging a phase of your life. Neil, you know what happened, you know, as a family, we had applied for our uh, permanent residence in the UK and the Home Office lost all our documents. I mean, everything. So it meant nobody could work, you know, and it, it meant that I myself found myself in a situation whereby I was homeless and I was the only one in my family who was homeless. And it was during the time of, it was in December 2010 when we had record snow and I literally thought I was going to die. It was minus seven on the first night that I was homeless. And um, every day I thought I was literally going to die. I thought that was the end of my life. But it was my faith in Jesus Christ again that kept me going, just praying the whole time and just knowing that, you know, there's gonna come a better day. Um, it was a very difficult situation, but it's quite ironic because on Sunday I was driving back from church and I was at the traffic lights. And there was a guy in a truck and he leaned over into my convertible and he said, can you tell me, please, how did you find, how, how, how were you able to buy a car like this? And I said to him, I read books. And he said, what kind of books did you read? Are you a solicitor? I said, no, I'm an accountant, ACCA. And he said, I need to look into this ACCA. Can you believe it? <laughs> unbelievable, unbelievable. But, I, but that's a complete, you know, your, your complete journey to success. But uh, one thing I would say is that you definitely, one, one of the qualities that you've demonstrated, Chengai, uh, based on your early days and your, your journey to where you are from, is a quality of resilience. Absolutely. So you clearly knew the kind of person, the kind of lady you wanted to be in the future. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. And, and nothing was going to move you from that goal. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. The other the other thing that I've noticed when when I have challenges, and I don't know whether you'll agree with me here, mm -hmm. is that if you try and just get through a single day, mm -hmm. so if you just focus on getting through a single day um, and let tomorrow kind of take care of itself, yes. what you find is you then have the strength to get through one day. And then, that is so true. Yeah. If, if you've got to one day, then you think, gosh, I can get through one more day and so on and uh, you you tend to put habits into place don't you okay that is so true neil yeah i've lived like that for many years because there were days when 
I only had food just for that day or just for that meal. I did not know where my next meal was coming from. And that went on for many years. But you know, as accountants, often you're trying to balance figures and the figures are not balancing or you know, documents are not in place and you don't know how you're going to put reports together. But like you say, if you can just take one day at a time, take things into bite-sized pieces, go month by month, trying to just you know, make sure things are balanced. But what people do sometimes they become overwhelmed. And then this is when they now start turning to other things you know, to try and comfort themselves. But if you just take each step, you know, one day at a time, step by step, one account at a time, you know, balance each one, and then you can get your accounts ready. Then it's not so overwhelming. I mean, I love month end. I love audit. But when I meet many accountants, they're like, oh no, month end again, that kind of thing. You know, if you just take things step by step, it can be manageable and enjoyable. Absolutely. Now, one of the things I, I found really interesting about what you did is that um, rather than sticking to just your basic role, you were also interested in other areas of the business. And uh, during your, uh, while, while you're, I think you were still studying at that point, uh, you were working for a company that was going through some financial difficulty. And right. um, you took it upon yourself to look at the broader issues facing the company and um, look to see what you could do to help that, that situation. Would That's you like right. to tell us a little bit about that? So this was a group of companies. And uh, when I was hired, they didn't inform me that they were planning for the group of companies to go in, into administration. So during my handover, that's when my predecessor told me that, oh, in two months time, the group of companies is going into administration. So obviously I was quite you know, disappointed because I thought this is my new job and so forth. And a few weeks into me taking on the number one position in the finance department, um, the CEO actually passed away. So the board didn't want to replace the CEO because they thought, well, everything's going under. But what I had to do is now not only take the number one position in the finance department, but I also had to cover the role of the CEO. So I had to present the accounts on a monthly basis in board meetings. And for me, I could see how the entire group of companies could turn around and actually survive. And when I told my strategy to the board, they thought I was crazy. So you have to remember, Neil, at the time, I was not yet part qualified. I had not finished my ACCA part two exams. So you didn't and have that credibility. Actually. That's right. Yeah. But my predecessors, that role I was doing had been previously done by qualified accountants and they had been when they did the interviews all the other candidates were qualified accountants but the ceo i caught his eye and he said i believe in you and i believe that you can do a better job than the other people who are qualified and that's why he hired me so what happened within three months i turned them from being a loss making to a profit making group of companies we broke even at that three point month point uh, which i'd been in that number one finance position and um, the board could not believe it uh, when they saw what was happening. You know, I increased the cash flow by 350,000. When I had my first um, payroll to pay out, there was less than one pound in the bank. So I had to think very fast. And it was, you know, one of the businesses was a property business and we had a tenant who I knew was cash rich and he was one of the highest paying tenants. And I called him and I said, look, I can give you a discount if you'll pay cash upfront for the next 12 months I'll let you pay 10 months instead of 12 months and he was very excited of course he took up that offer next thing we've got cash in the bank I was able to pay salaries that month it was just each day like we said before each, each step at a time one by one do you see and that's how we managed to and to this day that group of companies is still in existence I mean it's interesting what you said there Chiang but I think it took a lot of courage for you to stand in front of a board obviously as a lady, for, for example, yes. maybe, you know, you're uh, coming from a relatively a minority uh, background as well. Oh, yes. um, and, uh, you know, you were not qualified. What, right. um, how did you manage to overcome perhaps people's perception of you um, and actually show them um, what you were doing? Because I think um, many people coming from different backgrounds would perhaps struggle to, um, to present their views at a board level? 
You know, Neil, that was my first time to sit in a board meeting and to present, you know, financial accounts in a board meeting. But the thing is, when you walk into a room, if you have the mindset of, oh, I'm the only black person in the room. Oh, I'm the only woman in the room. Oh, I'm the youngest person in the room. Oh, I'm not even a qualified accountant. That's going to play on your mind. You need to go in with confidence. And it's just like, you know, uh, I play hockey as well at national level and I uh, played at under 21 World Cup. I played at senior women's and now I'm playing at master's level. When people see my team photos, they say, oh, let's see your team. Um, they say, oh, but how come you're the only black person? When I'm on the hockey field, I'm not thinking I'm the only black person. Do you understand? I'm not thinking I'm the only person from a person of minority. I'm, I think of myself, I'm a human being. I'm capable of doing everything that I set my mind to do. And that's the mindset that I have, you know, whether it's in the boardroom or on the sports field, that's the mindset I have. So, so that, that, that positive attitude is, yes. is so important. Yes. Um, and I think if you focus on your strengths rather than your weaknesses, yes. that then affects your communication. And Absolutely. as it influences your communication, it kind of influences your confidence as well. That's right. Yeah. And, That's and right. people then pick up on these nonverbal clues yes. um, and, and they start treating you a different way. That's right. Yeah. But, but, but the great thing what you did then is you actually backed up whatever you, you said you would do by actual, uh, actual actions that benefited the company. So, Absolutely. you know, there, there must be this, uh, this, um, synergy between what you say and what you do. Absolutely, because yeah. you know, Neil, when the board asked me to put together a budget, I'd never put a, a budget uh, together before in my life because I'd never been, you know, a finance manager before. So what I did is I did a, a budget, but in my mind, I said, you know what, these people, I know that they cannot see things the way I see things because I see the day to day running and I can see that this group of companies can survive. So what I'll do is, you know, you just need to water it down a bit so that people can receive it at your level. When I presented that budget to them, they said to me, you are crazy. Can you please go and change it? There's no way revenue is going to be like that. There's no way we're going to even make a profit. We're not even going to break even. We're going to make losses. So can you go and change your budget? When I now change the budget to satisfy them, do you know when we had the actual results at the end of the year, they even surpassed the first budget that I did? Amazing. That Absolutely amazing. Yeah. So you see that confidence um, and um, that um, positive attitude is yeah. very important in life, Chennai. Yes? It's true. You know, Neil, what I notice people do when they walk into meetings and when they walk into the boardroom, people like to agree with the top dogs. They don't want to contradict. They just want to go with the flow. People don't engage their brain to say, wait a minute, I went to school. Let me use my intelligence to look at the situation and know that, okay, we've got a problem like this. How can we solve this problem? Now, you see, what I notice is that often in meetings is that the way I think is very different to the way everybody else thinks. Now, you've got to have the courage to now speak up and say, wait a minute, this problem can be overcome if we do one, two, three, not what you're suggesting. Do you see? And this is where I find that I can get results because if I can see something, I know how I can make it happen. But people don't have the, that vision in the first place. So if you don't have the vision, you don't have the bold, and you've got nothing to say in the first place, which exactly. is going to be tangible. So, but how did you get this vision, you see? So I think, uh, what's the actual process behind it? You know, Neil, um, as we've said before, ACCA is not an easy um, subject a matter or any of the subjects yeah yeah every single exam is very difficult to get through and so people who are studying acca and other accountancy uh, qualifications at kaplan they are already above average of intelligence do you see what i'm saying yes and, and so, the ability to to solve problems and so on exactly yeah but when people now step from the classroom into the marketplace, you need to be able to use those transferable skills. You see, when you're under exam pressure, you know that you have to use your brain. If you don't put something on paper, which is going to make sense to the marker, you're not gonna get the marks and you're not gonna pass the exam. You have to deliver the goods. But sometimes when people are in the workplace, you know, they just kind of coast because there's no pressure. Okay, fine. 
I've got to make the bank rate balance, fine. I've got to produce the accounts, but look at those accounts, look at revenue, look at expenses, see what can you do about it to effect change on those figures so that at the end of the day, you can increase the profits and improve you know, the place where your uh, company is at. It's not just about you know, being case sera sera. You've got to have that dynamic attitude to say, I want to uh, in, in, install change and positive change in this company. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. So I think it's almost having that feeling that you have a vested interest exactly. in your company and to look outside your own, your own particular role to yes. see what you can do to improve the organization. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there are so many departments in every company. You've got to be able to communicate effectively with different departments so that you can, you know, get people on your side and to understand so that you can, because it takes a team to make things work. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it, it's not just about you having the vision. It's yeah. then about um, communicating it to others That's and right. motivating everyone. And do, do you find that at times, I, I think the, the main reason why people don't do this is people feel that there'll be no immediate reward for them. It's true. And also fear. You know, people will get overcome by fear. But when you say there'll be no reward, that's the way people think that's true. But it's not true that you won't get a reward, reward because I'll tell you what, in the role that I've been at, I didn't start off as a financial controller. I started off as a finance manager and there's our CFO. So someone else would have the mindset of, oh, the CFO is already there. I can't be promoted. I'll just do whatever, whatever in my role. No, I was dynamic. I was dynamic in improving processes, in, uh, you know, um, introducing changes. And when everybody could see that the um, company as a whole was benefiting, that's when the new role was created for me. And obviously I got a very good increase in salary. So there's the reward. Do you understand? There's the reward. But I think it's also having the patience, knowing that if I continue to stick with this, if I'm doing something positive, the yes. reward will come. Yes. See? Yes. And I think uh, one of the issues we have in today's world is that many people look for an instant reward. Well, I think you have to have the patience to, to know that actually the reward will come, but it may not come this year. You know, it may come a year from now, two years, and you have to invest that time and effort to make it happen. That's the reality of life. But what I've seen, Neil, is when if you can just kick your feet under your desk, put your head down and work hard, people will notice. People they will notice. Them. You're absolutely correct. Um, before we, we move on to all your successes, Chennai, I just want to talk a little bit about your actual studying. So, you know, and um, obviously you are my student, uh, you know, you did advanced tax with me. Yes. I, in class, you are very participative. Uh, you know, we, 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 we became friends, you and I. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and but what kind of um, um, advice would you give people when they're approaching, you know, complex technical subjects, such as, for example, advanced tax? I would advise students that, you know, whatever challenges that you are facing in the course of your studies, if you'll just keep focused, you, you will reach your goal and you will succeed in what you want to do. And, you know, as, as a sports person, fine, i play at international level, that's fine. I play at regional level for London as well. That's fine. But, you know, sometimes it's just about getting up from your desk and doing that walk around the block. You know, just that fresh air can just give you those fresh ideas in your mind. You know, for someone else, it could be signing up for a gym membership and just having that discipline to say, I'm going at least three to four days a week. You know, you get so, in there. So, yeah. So I think one of the important points there, I just break it down so people can understand what you're saying, is sure. discipline. I think that yes. that's a key factor. So Absolutely. if you want to be successful in your professional studies, you do need discipline. That's right. And um, how did you manage to uh, put in the work for your studies while you were, you know, while you had a full time job as well? It was not easy. I tell you what, Neil, when we were in the heat of things and I was at that company where I was telling you that, you know, within two months time, they said everything was going into administration. I was turning up at work like seven o'clock in the morning. I was leaving like 10 at night. I was putting in the, the extra work. Often I would miss my lectures, you know, but I knew that, you know what, at the moment I need to save this group of companies 
And I did that for a few months. I actually did miss a couple of exams, but I knew that I was going to take up my exams later and be able to study. And when I was, uh, uh, when I've now brought the group of companies to a certain place, I mean, not everyone's going to find themselves in that dire straits position. I knew that, you know what, every day, every day you've got to wake up. I would wake up early in the morning. I would read. Then I would go to the gym. Then I would go to work. During my lunchtime, I didn't play games. That one hour solid, I was working. I mean, I remember when um, I did my tax paper, F, F6, it was called in those days. Yeah. yeah. Um, you the know, first, the, the first... at the skills level. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I did not attend any lectures for that first tax paper because I didn't have the money. But every lunchtime I was there, I would go to another room, close myself in that office, and I would just be doing questions, doing questions, doing questions. So you just got to be disciplined after work. If I wasn't playing sport, if I wasn't at church, I was studying. You need to be very disciplined. I mean, at advanced level, it was crazy. You know, there was a season where I wasn't working, which helped me with my advanced um, um, level papers. So I would literally wake up at six o'clock in the morning. And at the very latest, nine o'clock, I would have to be at my desk and I would study for 12 hours straight, obviously right. taking breaks in between. But you've got to know the price of the course that you have selected and you know you can't um say i'm going to build a house if you haven't um you know put, put a proper foundation exactly um, yeah. you've got to have that foundation and know the cost and, and i think well, one interesting point that i got from what you said Chennai, yeah. is that you know at, through your academic career at kaplan as you said uh you did because of this work work issue you had yes. you had to make a difficult decision Yes. that look actually you know because my work uh the work issues are actually more immediate what i'm going to do is i'm going to put my studies on a back burner for yes. one or two sittings you yes. see but it's it's i think having that maturity whereby um you know you say fine um actually you know i'm, I'm dealing with something immediate now yes. let me deal with that and then i'll yes. come back to my studying at the next sitting that's right. And, and I think that that's even easier for students to do now, because um, as you know, when you were studying, you just had two sittings a year, yes. June and December. But that's now right. uh, the ACCA students have actually four sittings a year. That's so, right. uh, you know, March, June, uh, September and December. So so even if you miss a sitting, let's yes. say you have a family problem or you've got a work issue, you can yes. always come back and and pick up your studies. In you know, Neil, this is such an important point because I cannot tell you how many workplaces I've worked in and how many people I've met who say, oh, I once used to study ACCA. Oh, I don't want to hear about ACCA anymore. You know, I failed the exams. I don't want to hear about it again. It doesn't matter. You can be going through something. You know, some people are full-time carers or maybe uh, children or elderly parents. And, you know, you just know when you put in the extra time with them for a season, but you can come back to it. Look at me. I was homeless. On one of the days when I was homeless, I was supposed to be writing my F9 exam. I couldn't even get to the exam hall. I would have had to walk for hours. I didn't even have my books. My books had been locked up somewhere. I didn't even know, you know. But, you know, once that season was over of being homeless, I wasn't like, oh, woe is me. What am I going to do now? Let me carry on with this cleaning job I have. No, I'm like, I'm in this cleaning job for a season. I was telling the people I was cleaning for, one day I'm going to be a chartered accountant. And they would laugh at me. Like, what, what chartered accountant are you talking about? You're a cleaner, you know. <laughs> and now they look and they see the and, and, and yes absolutely and 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 i think you know you you're you're someone who epitomizes um success Chennai, because you've been through that and i think um you know when you've been through challenges it actually makes you enjoy the blessings and the success you've achieved even more absolutely it's much sweeter and you know everybody goes through challenges you know you see people going through things and you know i remember some students saying oh you know, I've got to choose whether I pay my rent or whether I pay for my student visa. And they'd be like, I'm staying for my student, I'm going for my student visa. So I think I'm going to be kicked out of the place where I'm living. You know, everybody faces, you know, huge challenges in life, but you've got to know that, do you know what? I'm still going to finish that, um, cross that finish line. You know, just take everything in your stride one day at a time. And before you know it, You'll forget all those struggles. You know? Exactly. Yeah. So the important lesson I think from that is never give up. 
Yes. Absolutely. Never give up. Keep on going. Um, you know, at times we all have to take a break from our from our um, from our goals and aspirations because of yes. because of certain life events we might That's be right. facing. But um, despite taking a break, don't give up on yourself. Exactly. And those who fail exams as well, you may have circumstances that are too pressurized for you and cause you to fail your exams. Just because you failed, it doesn't mean you mustn't go back. Guess what? When I tell people I also failed exams, I think I'm telling them a story, you know, like you, you actually failed an exam. Yes, I did. But guess what? I've now got my name on that piece of paper that says ACCA and nobody can take it from me. And if I were to go to for an interview, no one's going to ask me how many times did you fail or did you fail an ACCA exam? They don't care about that. Can you deliver the goods? Yes. There's the evidence. That, that's the important factor. And the yes. important factor is you have to reach the goal. You see? That's right. Um, you know, I, in fact, what the ACCA is struggling with now is many people have reached the professional level. Yes. But because they're actually in a perhaps a, a comfortable job right. and uh, maybe they failed one or two exams. Yes. Um, um, they, they've actually stopping stopping their journey you see yeah. and and they're hanging on there without finishing the qualification so i think that the message from you is say is to say look yes you might have to take a break but keep on going and and get it done because the rewards are there and uh, you will have the rewards further down the line yes and when you finish the uh, when you cross that finish line don't forget to come back and help others who are just oh. like you and encourage them you know we yes. all need to be advocates for acca and Absolutely. you know there are people who i've spoken to who i've managed to get them to go back and keep on studying and they're finished i mean people contact me even on linkedin from all over the world from india pakistan zimbabwe south africa even america and you know you just be there for that support you know encouraging someone you know mentoring them and next thing you know they've crossed the finish line <laughs> Absolutely great. And I think that's what you and I have in common, Chennai, which is why I've selected you for this for this interview, whereby um, the, the whole reason why we're doing this, um, doing this interview is to help inspire other people and to give back uh, to others so that they can enjoy uh, some of the benefits we have enjoyed. That's right. I mean, my life has totally transformed and it's, you know, I, I, I thank God for that. Everything I have, you know, God has blessed me and I have a good life now. I'm pleased. I don't, I don't have struggles. You know, I don't have the financial issues that I used to have. So, you know, it's, it's nice to be in that good place whereby you can also help your family and so forth, you know. Um, so I do encourage people to keep going. Absolutely. And now what I want to do, Chengai, is talk a little bit about the nice part of, uh, of all your struggles, which is the victory. Because yes. uh, back in 2016, you were then notified that you had then uh, passed both your exams and your professional experience record. And, uh, you know, you were able to feature in a couple of magazines as well as a fully uh, qualified professional accountant. So yes. how did that feel for you? It was such an honor. You know, I remember the day when I received the email from ACCA saying that for you, it's a double celebration. Congratulations on passing all your exams and completing your PER. And it was so nice of them to acknowledge, you know, that I put in the effort because what many students do, as you'll know, Neil, they'll do the exams. And then when it comes to the PER, they put it on the back burner, which means that you qualify sometimes even years later than you could have. But what I did is I made sure that I did everything concurrently. I didn't forget about my PER. I was always trying to work and making sure that my manager was signing those things off. So, you know, it's all, um, it's, it's all so exciting, you know, when you do get those rewards. And I was able to feature in the ACCA AB Accounting and Business uh, Magazine um, when I qualified. And that was very exciting. I never imagined such an honor. Um, that was great. And when I was a Kaplan as well, I mean, I never dreamt that I would get into the Kaplan uh, prospectus. That was just an absolute dream come true. <laughs> Absolutely. And considering that, you know, you used to dream of, you know, when you used to pass Kaplan, you used to dream that one day, you you know, hopefully you'll have enough money to attend a course there. And exactly. then you actually featured in our prospectus as a, as a successful student. But I also understand, Chengai, you've also uh, spoken at various uh, Women's Day events uh, to other aspiring ladies and so on. Um, yeah. do, um, what's your message to, to women out there who are looking to... Um, 
to cope with the current cost of living crisis we have and are struggling to uh, build a professional career. Yes, I mean, being a woman can be very challenging. You know, the dynamics can be different to that of being a man. Why? Because women also, you know, you may want to start a family and, you know, being the mother, you want to spend time with your children. I don't have children of my own, but I've had the privilege of raising my young brother as my own child. And uh, this year he's 30 years old. So I've seen it, I've done every school run from nursery school, junior school, high school. I did every parent's evening. I know what it is, all the homework, every lunchbox, I made it through to university. So it takes a lot of commitment, a lot of sacrifice, and you've got to be there for the children, especially when they're young, you know, with bottle feeding and nappy changing, it's no joke. I mean, I was 15 years old when my little brother was born, but I was very much involved in his upbringing. So with women, I would say, you know, just because you have that break sometimes, it doesn't mean that you can't come back. You can come back and actually give yourself a very good life and a good life for your family as well. You know, if you can just be able to have the courage to, you know, turn around and finish those ACCA exams, you know, um, being a woman, it's, it can be very challenging, especially with the cost of living. You know, I've been through many years whereby I did not see one pound in like three months. That's how poor I was. I did not know where my next meal was coming from, from. for years. I didn't know how I was going to get to my um, lectures sometimes. Sometimes I didn't know whether I would spend the whole day with something to eat, to eat or nothing to eat. And you just got to be able to budget, be realistic. You know, if you don't have, just find out uh, what resources are available to you and know that, do you know what? Things can be hard today, but tomorrow, if you can totally forget. Tomorrow is a brand new start. Exactly. Yeah. Your whole life can just be transformed, but you need to do something about it. You can't just sit back. You know, uh, there are so many students I studied with Neil and, you know, they didn't finish. And when I look at their lives now, now it's, it's just so sad, you know, and I look at some people, I'm like, you could be earning three, four, five times what you're earning if you just finish your exams. You know, many people. Exactly. And I think people people kind of get caught in a trap of their own making yeah. whereby, you know, because they they um, they don't um, achieve what they want. They then kind of associate with other people who are in that same position. That's right. And it's almost like they create the bars of their own prison. Right. See? And yeah. and because these bars are created by them, they then can't break out of it. And it's, it's so sad to see that. It's so sad. I mean, if I can come from homelessness to the place I am right now, by the grace of God, you know, anything's possible. People should not give up. Exactly. And uh, one, of the, one of the things I feel um, about you, Ching, I, which has led to your success, and I found this a common theme in, in, um, in many other successful people, is your, um, your uh, sports ability. So I think uh, when you play a sport, it um, it makes sure that uh, you it instills certain characteristics in it in, yeah. in you, such as discipline, such as competitiveness, That's such right. as uh, you know trying to be better than than the other people who you're competing with. That's right. So would you like to tell us a little bit about your your hockey um, your hockey journey now? Yes. Yeah. So I, I started playing hockey at the age of eight, and as I mentioned earlier, I was made hockey captain at that tender age of the Phillies hockey team at school. And I was captain throughout junior school uh, up to the age of 12 and captain at senior school from the age of 13 to um, 18 as well. I also played for my province um, in Zimbabwe, which was Mashonaland. And um, at the age of 19, when I left school, that's when I was selected for the under 21 uh, hockey team. And we played in the... Um, under 21 World Cup hockey qualifying tournament. And uh, Zimbabwe, we won silver in that tournament. And then Amazing. after that, it was after that tournament that a few of us got promoted to the senior women's hockey team. And I went on tour with the Zimbabwe uh, senior women's hockey team and we played international matches on home ground as well. And um, it's very interesting, Neil. I actually did not play hockey for 19 years. Wow. Yes. So I went, the last senior women's tour that I went on was in 1999. And then when I came to this country and I was going through all the 
issues with papers and you know when the home office lost our papers you know hockey is a very expensive sport oh so i didn't think of that as expensive it is yeah. very expensive oh. mm -hmm. i mean recently um you know we had the england hockey uh, championships which were held in bristol and so the seven regions within um england came together and we were competing so i live in surrey and before our hockey club used to fall into the surrey area but for the first time ever, they decided they wanted a London Masters hockey team. So all the hockey clubs within the M25 came together and we did trials for two months. That was um, earlier in the year, I think it's March and April. And then they selected a Masters, a London Masters hockey team. And I was uh, fortunate to be selected for that team. And we went and competed in the England Championships. So it's incredible, absolutely <laughs> incredible. Yeah. So it can't have been easy for you to make, you know, to after leaving hockey for so so long, to then reach that level of physical fitness and everything to, to continue your, your hockey career. So what actually happened was in 2018, the Zimbabwe uh, hockey team contacted me and they said, Chengai, can you come and play in the Masters World Cup? And I said, no. I haven't played hockey in 19 years. And then I spoke to the coach and the coach said, Chengai, do you play any sport? And I said, well, I have a British tennis ranking. And he said, well, do you train? I said, yes. And my coach is the head professional tennis coach at the tennis club. And he said, well, you're on the team. The girls say that back in the day, you were amazing and I'd like to have you on the team. So we went and we played at the Masters World Cup that was in Spain in 2018 in July. And when we got there, the coach said to me, you know, when I met you in London for the first time, I thought you looked a bit dainty, you know, the way you were dressed. And because we weren't playing hockey at that time, we just met up to have a meeting and we had a meal. And um, he said, one thing I can say to you is you're the fittest and you're the strongest player I've got on this team. That's and incredible. I'm yeah, going to look yeah. after you. So after Amazing. having all that break, you know, yeah. sports, when, you, when you're skilled in one sport, it is transferable to another sport. I'm sure you've seen some Olympic um, uh, medalists whereby they transfer from one sport to another sport and they still win medals you see it's that level of fitness that level of strength that's you know stamina that um you know that that strength that you have in you that you can just transfer from one sport to the other so it's been an honor and a privilege to you know play at that level of the amazing year. amazing um we're now going to come to um um our uh, key message to students um and um and listeners of this program and i think uh, as you pointed out i mean if we just stick with the hockey first certainly playing sport and doing a uh, physical exercise does lead to both discipline and determination uh, do you think this will help people who do this by playing sport or keeping fit do you think that will then help them in their professional career as well you see what happens neil I, I normally like to train like six o'clock in the morning in the gym. And the days when I train, by the time I get to my laptop, my brain is already like in ninth gear, do you see? The days I don't train, it's like you kind of have to warm up, do you see? And I see that my mental performance is much better when I've trained in that morning time. But regardless of what time of day you train, what happens when you exercise, it's like endorphins are kicked into your body makes you feel happy, your mood is better, you're more alert. So that's why I say, you know, not everybody's going to play at national level when it comes to sport. But for someone else, it might just be that walk around the block, you know, that just lifts you up and gets your spirits. Next thing you'll be walking five miles, 10 miles. Before you know it, you might be doing from couch to 5K running, you know. There are different ways of exercising and it really does help you mentally and on the job. And, you know, there are times whereby I've may perhaps gone on holiday or I've, you know, decreased my exercise for some reason or another. And when I now say, no, no, let me go back into it now, start training very hard. I always say, wow, I must never, ever backslide from my training again, because it's that uh, the delivery at work, the way you see the difference, you know, you're just on the ball, that mental alertness, you can just be more productive. You got, you're more productive. Incredible. I think you also have a lot more energy. Don't you agree? That's right. Yeah. I, I find when I'm fit and I'm going to the gym regularly, I have a lot more energy. I can get a lot of stuff done. And uh, you're happier freshly. overall. Yes. And I think, uh, you know, your mental wellness is so important. Uh, you know, in today's um, 
post pandemic time, uh, many people are talking about a mental health uh, epidemic now, whereby okay. uh, people uh, lose um, lose the 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 joy of living each day, and um, and I think by by constant exercise, um, you know, this then creates the chemical reaction in your body, and you you start feeling a lot happier and a lot more buoyant in everything that you do. Yes, a lot of people suffered during lockdown. I mean, I love lockdown because my life is just so busy normally, but <laughs> and I thrived on that because, you know, I was able to run outdoors, you know, I wasn't in the gym and I was just able to train a lot harder because I was on my own. I didn't have the coaches, but, you know, a lot of people suffer from their um, mental health and, you know, um, people went through loneliness and that sort of thing. But you've got to be aware that, you know, if you are prone to loneliness, if you're prone to mental health issues, you know, surround yourself with the right people. Get yourself help in time before anything worse happens to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I'd say that that's one of your key takeaways from this. Uh, first, you know, the, the, the benefits of playing sport. I think the other key takeaway that uh, that uh, you've been talking about is regardless of whatever challenges uh, people face, yes. as long as they keep focused on their end goal, they have the ability to actually get there. Yes. And be resilient. And, and there's, then, there's and another one. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to add, Neil, you mm -hmm. know, one thing that I base my life on is integrity. I'm a person of integrity and I find if you can be honest and be a straightforward person, like um, I remember in our accountancy studies, they say an accountant must always be honest and straightforward in all their dealings. And if you, you know, I remember when I was leaving uh, that company, I was telling you about that group of companies, you know, that's it's still in existence. You know, one of the people said to me that, Chengai, what I like about you is that you're a person of integrity. You do not care who is saying the wrong thing. You will speak up with the voice of integrity and you will ensure that that voice gets heard, you know, by the right people. And one thing I've seen in life is that if you can just be a person of integrity, it can take you places. And of course, as a Christian, you know, um, you know, as a, uh, the Bible says, you must be honest and you know, straightforward as well. And that is, I base my life on the Bible. So that, that's, that's absolutely amazing. I, I do want to emphasize to all the listeners here that um, obviously at Kaplan, um, th this is not a religious, um, <laughs> um, you know, um, uh, position, obviously. Um, and, uh, but, but, you know, having that faith in, yes. in, in your life, having some kind of spiritual belief is yes. definitely such a source of strength. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're Muslim, you're Hindu, you're Buddhist, or you don't even believe in God. Um, as long as you have that spiritual strength in you, that will then help you get through the difficult challenges you're facing. Um, and well, one of the last things I'd like to touch on, uh, Chennai, is, um, you know, your, uh, you've talked about it earlier, the importance of helping other people. So, um, you know, it, it hasn't been what you've done is what, even though you've been successful, um, you've always felt um, that you've got to help mentor other people and um, and get and, and and help them overcome their challenges. So uh, would you like to talk a little bit more about this? You know, the other day I was at my hairdressers, Neil. Mm. And my hairdresser was saying to yeah, me... Yeah, so your hair's looking great now, Chengai. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. My hairdresser was saying to me that, Chengai, do you know my daughter would not have passed her degree if it wasn't for your help? And I was a bit startled because I remember her asking me questions from time to time. And, you know, I would encourage her. But she was actually studying digital marketing. So for me, you know, I don't just limit my help to accountancy students everywhere I'm going. If there's someone who I can put in a good word to just encourage them, just to support them, it's just a, a, a lifestyle now for me, do you see? If someone reaches out to me on LinkedIn, says I'm from whichever country they're from, you know, please, can you help me? I see you've managed to pass your exams and become successful. Please, can you help me? I will help that person for the time that I'm able to, you know, help them and to encourage them. So I think it's very, it is very important to, to help others along the way and to give them that support and encouragement. Exactly. And I think um, that's such an important lesson because um, being successful in life, I think people tend to equate that with materiality. Yes. Okay? But 
actually um, by you being successful and you know you having enough to take care of yourself what you can then do then is after taking care of yourself you obviously can take care of your family and then you can extend that to your community That's and awesome. and you know all of entire mankind and i think it's important for people to see that they're part of this greater community in which we live in that's true that is so true because you know the church i go to is actually a community church and on saturday we met up and what we do is we were going out into the community and approaching members of the public and you know speaking to them and you know just listening to people's stories and sharing our stories with them and encouraging them. And it's just so powerful. You meet all kinds of people. I mean, even being in the church um, uh, environment, you know, I've seen, I've been in the same church for 20 years. So I've seen some kids even being born in church and now going to university and some parents will come to me and they'll be like, Chengai, you know, I've heard about the course you study. Please, can you speak to my son, my daughter? You know, the other day, a young man came to me, he was 18 years old and he said, please, can you help me? I'd like to be an accountant. And, you know, it just makes my heart swell with so much pride that this young man has been watching me for 18 years. And he says, I would like to be an accountant. Please help yeah, me. So almost you see the, the, the persona you've you've portrayed to them uh, mm -hmm. has been one that they want to aspire to now. And, right. and, and this young man has seen your um, has seen your success and mm -hmm. he wants to emulate you in his life. And I think that's the greatest compliment that anyone can pay you. Yes. And even on LinkedIn, you know, on occasion, I will see somebody who's in sixth form sending me a request to connect. That makes me feel so happy that, wow, a child who is still in school is looking at me to admire me. And I think, wow, that's amazing. Of course, I want to connect with you. You know, if there's any way I can support you, encourage you, even if it's just by keeping quiet and they just watch, they're just watching you. It's like a child. You know, they watch the way the parent acts and they'll follow Absolutely. And I'd like, uh, Chengai, for you to just uh, um, um, tell our listeners um, a little bit about uh, your LinkedIn details, your LinkedIn profile. So, you know, if should they want uh, to uh, ask you something, uh, they, they, they can reach out to you. Yes. So I am Chengai Riretzo on my LinkedIn profile. Would you like to? Sorry, sorry, Chengai. You know, I, I know it's easy for you uh, being from Zimbabwe to yes. say your surname, but I, I would like you, if you don't mind, to spell it. Yes, yes. I, um, being from Kenya myself, I yes. still find it difficult to, to pronounce your surname. <laughs> That's fine. So my first name is C-H-E-N-G-A-I, Chengai, and my surname, Riretzo. R-U-R-E-D-Z-O. So on LinkedIn, I'm HTTP colon, two slashes, linkedin.com slash I-N slash Chengai Riretzo, all one word. Thank you so much for that, Chengai. Chengai, I'd like to thank you for this amazing opportunity uh, that uh, where you've shared your 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 journey, your your, your professional uh, challenges that you've had, um, and how you um, you managed to focus on becoming the successful person you are. I'd like to thank you for uh, imparting your wisdom and inspiration to all the listeners here, and I'd like you to wish you every success in the future. Neil, thank you very much. It's been such an honor, such an honor to spend time with you today. Thank you for inviting me. Likewise. Okay.